Thank you, Luke. Uh, great to have someone who uh, will pitch in because of all the things he did, those are the things that make me the most nervous. When to stand up, when to sit down, when to do that. So where's Brad? Brad is with his father. His father is celebrating his 80th birthday. And so Brad will return next week. You know, getting a minister or getting somebody to speak, I, I know Brad asked certain people before he got to me, and uh, I could tell it in his voice, his desperation. Uh, so you know it because you turned him down. Every Sunday morning, the story goes, his mom would knock on the basement door. Steve was her last child, and to put it nicely, poetically, <clears throat> he failed to launch and had took up camp in her basement, living there for many years. But she was beating on his door this morning because it was Sunday morning and she said, it's time to get up. I don't want to be late for church. He ignored her, rolled over. A few minutes later, looking at the clock, she Beat on the door again. Steve, get up. It's Sunday morning. I do not want to be late for church. So he comes back and he says, Mom, give me three good reasons that I need to get up this morning to go to church. She said, okay. One, I'm your mom. And that's reason enough. Two, you're under my roof. And as long as you're going to live under my roof, my rules. And the third reason you need to get up and get ready to go to church 
Just because you're the minister. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm here and I arrived on time. I'm the minister. <coughs> when Brad asked me a few months ago to cover for him, I start thinking of what I'm going to develop. And I thought about fear. A lot of fear going around. I thought, well, that would be a good topic. So I began to work on fear. And I found that there's two expressions in the Bible that appear numerous times. One is fear not. The other one is do not be afraid. Would you care to guess how many times those two phrases appear in our Bibles? Thank you. Because I don't have a prize for you. But I wish you'd have held back just a little bit. But I'm trying to develop. I appreciate you working with me. I really do. As she so correctly said, 365. Fear not. And do not be afraid. Here in the Bible, 365 times each. Now, I know you're saying, well, Phil, you and Kathy must be biblical scholars to have developed this response. I don't know where she got her answer. I Googled it. But then I changed course. And I wanted to leave. Every time I speak, I try to think, can I put something in your heart to think about in 15 minutes after you leave? Two hours after you leave, two days, was something that I said come back into your mind. It's a challenge. And I did not want to leave you with the taste of fear. So I changed. I'm going to talk about something that's fabulous, and that's heaven. And my topic, where's home? You know, Kenny Chesney once saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. And that pretty much sums it up. We work hard to develop our home. And our home is where our families are, where our identity is. An interesting point. The closer we are to heaven, the closer we are to our home, we describe it differently. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but if I went to the Grand Canyon and somebody heard me talk in this dialect, and they said, where's home? I wouldn't tell them 4100 Lily Field, would I? I'd say Tennessee. I might even say the South. But if I was at Cool Springs sitting on a bench waiting for Susie to finish shopping and got in a conversation with another fellow guy waiting there for his wife to quit shopping, and he says, where do y'all live? Where's home? I wouldn't say Tennessee. He already knew that pretty much. I would say South of Nashville. The closer we are to our home, the more we describe it in exact terms. So if you pull up in the driveway at 4100 Lily Field in Caney Springs, I'm in my easy chair. That's home. That's the closest I can get. That's how we identify the place that we call home. And it's always good to be home from a trip, isn't it? A lot of folks take their homes with them. Traveling down the interstate, you see this big truck, and then right behind it is a camper, and that camper just goes on and on and on, and then behind it is a car or a pickup truck, and it's loaded with stuff. They're carrying as much of their home with them to their next home that they're going to stay at for a brief time and come back. But we're in church this morning. So I ask you, where is home? And I'll give you a hint. Go to your heart. And the answer should be heaven. That is our home. Our scripture this morning is one that's, that's not the most common one to think about heaven, but I think it's appropriate for the, the, what I'm trying to develop for us this morning. Set our minds and keep them set on what is above, not on things that are on earth. 
But in parentheses, in this particular Bible, it said, keep our minds set on higher things. Jesus is the only person who's been to heaven and has returned to tell. Some have stories from being on their deathbed and seeing bright lights or uh, 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 some way that we're trying to, that they think they've been to heaven. And I can't take their experience away from them, but I prefer to only listen to one person who says he's been there that we know has been there. I can use John's Gospel and the book of Revelation through some very smart people that have helped me understand some truths about heaven. And if you'll allow me, I'll share it with you. First, Jesus assured us that there will be accommodations in heaven for all of us. Sometimes I think of judgment and I get angst. I get worried. Am I going to make the cut? But Jesus assures me that I will. In my Father's house, there are many abiding places. The, old, the older King James Version refers to many mansions. But Jesus was simply trying to say there would be room for everybody. Isn't it ironic that Jesus came to earth and there was no room for him in the Bethlehem Inn? But when he got to heaven, we won't have to worry. There will be no vacancy, or worry about no vacancy signs in heaven. Jesus assures us that there will be accommodations for us all. The second thing he told us about heaven is reservations are required. A recent study said 87% of all people believe they're going to heaven. And this is kind of confounding to me because not 87 people are in church every day. Not every, it just seems like that's a higher percentage. But there's, that was what the, it came back. But here's another statistic. 100% will have to pass a test. And that's to die. And on that point, I don't want to be morbid. I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole of something that would be hard to talk about. So if you'll allow me, I want to share a true story. It happened to my father, James Comstock. He was a personnel director. And one of the roles that my dad took on as personnel director was any time an employee, a member of the immediate family, aunt or uncle passed away, dad made a point to either go by visitation or to go to the funeral. Sunday after, Sunday after church was a routine that I well remember to this day. We'd come home from church, we'd have a family meal, Dad would turn on WJJU. And there with pen and paper and pan, he would chart out, as he nodded, yep, I know who that is, he would chart out his afternoon. He would start out possibly in Lewisburg, then on to Flasky, maybe to Shelby going and paying his respects to every family that was in his family. And on, there was a gentleman that died, and then please, please, I'm not making any disparaging remarks about uh, minority or black, just the opposite. Total respect. My dad <laughs> always told me that there was a special reverence in a black funeral that you wouldn't see other times in other places. But on this one occasion, an endeared black employee passed away. And his funeral was planned for Tuesday afternoon in a little country church in Pulaski. This was long before air conditioning. My dad was not a funny man. Quite serious, in fact. But on times that he would share a story that he brought back from work, it was usually attributed to one of two people. Some of you knew George Arnold. Some of you knew, possibly, Gerald Cash. My dad wouldn't be the instigator of these stories, but he would bring them home and share them, and he would laugh at something that George or Gerald had done. As dad was leaving work early that day to go to the funeral, George 
approached Dad and said, can I go to that funeral with you? I, I love that man, and, and I, I didn't get a chance to go to this place. That's a true high book. Gerald was off side, and Gerald said, can I go to you? I'd like to go. So the three men loaded up and headed to the hills of Giles County to this funeral. They were easy to spot. They were the only three white people in this packed Baptist church on that hot summer afternoon. They were seated down front when the service began. The minister, and I, I guess it's true for all ministers, we've all been to funerals where it's just like, we please hurry up and finish. I think they get excited to see the church filled up. And they just feel like it's an obligation, a calling. I've got priestly folks to heaven right now. I'm going to speak right over that gentleman sitting laying in front of me. And I'm going to see if I can win some souls right here in this church this afternoon. And I think Dad said that may have been what was going on in his mind. And so here he goes. And he's fired up. And he turns the corner to the end, Dad said. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, you must repent today so that you will be prepared for your heavenly reward. Because he said, death is inevitable for us all. <laughs> and it didn't land right. Dad said that he heard it and he thought, Maybe I didn't hear it right. So the, so the pastor circled around again, made a few comments, and he says, because death is inedible for us all. <laughs> My dad was dignified, and he could handle it. But he felt the pew begin to shake. <laughs> and he looked over, he said, to George Yarbrough, who now had his, his handkerchief out, and his head buried in his handkerchief, and was just red as a beat. He glanced at Gerald Cashin, this funny guy who was always telling jokes, and Gerald was just hunkered down in prayer and reverence, but the pew is shaking. And Dad said he found himself between these two guys, and he's just breathing and trying to you know, Dad can handle it. And all of a sudden, Dad said, it died down, and he thought we were going to make it. But someone in the back had a spiritual moment, moment and, and called out, Oh! And he said, Everybody just broke loose. Like, and they laughed hard. We've all had those experiences where we laugh so hard we cry. And Dad said, On that day, people left that church. There was not a dry eye in, the, in that place. Yeah, it's inevitable. Back to the second point. Jesus told us about heaven where reservations are required. That is, everybody except children. Children get a free pass. Everyone else has to have a reservation. I go to prepare a place for you. The moment that we confess our sins, declare our faith that Jesus as our Savior, our places in heaven are set aside. Our reservations are made. Our name is put in the book of life. You don't need to prepay you don't need to worry. Our reservations are offered by grace and received by faith. The thief who died on the cross with Jesus made his heavenly reservation during his last moments and he simply turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. And remember Jesus' reply, today you will be with me in paradise. Now that thief, in my point, my mind, was pretty lucky. He had lived, apparently, a life of, Ill, of, of sin, of theft. He was paying a price on the cross, but yet he had lucked out, if you will, and found himself near Jesus. It's risky to wait until the last minute to make important reservations. If you plan a vacation in Paris, I'm talking about the one in France, not the one in Tennessee, you wouldn't wait till the day before to make your arrangements. Neither does it make sense to postpone some <coughs> eternal reservations, especially when you don't know your day of departure. The 
The third thing we can learn about heaven is that the route or path we take to get there. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The lost traveler asked the old man sitting on the front porch, is this the best road to take to town? The old man thought for a minute and spoke up and said, son, it's the only road to town. Having Jesus as our personal Savior is the only way we can get to our town, heaven. Long before GPS, if you were in a strange town, you would ask somebody how to get somewhere. They would probably give you verbal instructions. Or they might even write out a map. You could still get lost. But the best way to get to a destination that you were not familiar with is for them to personally take you there. Jesus offers personal escort to heaven. At the moment we breathe our last breath, I think this is so comforting. He has promised to send angels to take us to our heavenly home. And as we approach the doors of heaven, Jesus is there and he points to us and he said, this is my child. I died for him or I am this person's sponsor. Susie and I wanted to go to New York, and I was quite apprehensive because I could just think of all the things that could go wrong. I heard people talk about getting in a taxi and spending an hour trying to get from one place to the other. The idea of being in the subway, I couldn't keep up with the directions. Susie came up with an idea. She said, let's see if Owen and Ron, they've been to New York countless times. Let's see if they'll go. So we contacted them, and I was surprised how graciously they, uh, they were interested in going, uh, not realizing that Susie had offered to pay all their costs. <laughs> <laughs> but with their helping hand, they met us at the hotel where we were staying, where we all were staying. And from that moment on, I never worried. I never felt uncomfortable. I knew I was going to get to see everything I wanted to see in New York, and that's exactly what happened. The trip was great, largely because we knew they knew where we were going, and they, all we needed to do was follow. If you under, ever wondered whether or not you're on the way to heaven, just ask this one question. Am I in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? If the answer is yes, you're on track. And the fourth and final thing you need about heaven. The atmosphere is awesome. In Revelation 21, a disciple named Joseph tried to describe heaven. And he used, uh, the author said, the poor man was verbally stressed to find descriptive adjectives to describe what he was seeing in this awesomeness. And so he thought of everything precious to us on earth. Gold, gates of pearls. But really, that doesn't exactly ring our bell, does it? We don't need to live in gold mansions or ride down pearly, uh, see pearly gates or jasper towers. Here's what heaven is in different terms. Imagine a place where no one is sick. The blind see, the hard of hearing hear. <coughs> Everyone, everyone has a healthy body. Each person is valued and makes a contribution. Each child is loved and affirmed. Not a single person is addicted or prejudiced or greedy. Imagine a place where there's plenty of food, where no child or adult is ever hungry. And they never want for a roof over their head. 
Picture a world in where a former Chinese and, a, and an American sit down at a table to have a conversation, but they can't remember which is which. Laughter and praise are constantly there. You get up every morning to be busy doing right, and every day is spent helping others. And it's fun. The glory of God is so pervasive that we can hardly restrain a song, and every one of us can sing on King. Banished from this area and this place we call heaven of worry, and grief, jealousy, frustration, and lust, and anger. You go to bed thinking it couldn't get any better, and in the morning, it is. And maybe the best part, there's no worry of sin. I read a funny story about a lady who, a Catholic lady who was professing her sins and she was hard of hearing and didn't gauge her voice correctly and was in the booth and speaking very loudly of the sins she had committed to the Father. And he was concerned first for her privacy and maybe a little for the for this sanctity of the confessional. So he suggested that she write down her sins and just bring those in the confessional. So the next week, that's exactly what she did. She came in, had a list, and slid it to, to Father Dan. He looked at it for a moment, and he says, what is this? It looks like a grocery list. And she says, oh my gosh, I've left my list of sins at Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus takes that list of sins that we left at Kroger and watched them up, never to be mentioned, thought of, heard again. So I ask you to think on higher things in the days to come and put these thoughts in our mind. There is a place for every believer. Reservations are required, but the route to heaven is clear. The atmosphere is all is awesome. So the next time someone asks you, where's home? And I know you'll say Tennessee or Southern Middle Tennessee or Marshall County or Lewisburg or the specific address where you live. But I hope in a moment, in just a tiny moment, when someone asks, where's home? Your heart says, 